Hello, and thanks for joining us for this week's podcast. Before we get started, we just want to tell you, we're always interested in finding out about new cases. For Into the Killing, we'd love to know about cold cases that were eventually solved. But we'd also like to hear about cases for our two YouTube channels, Criminally Listed and Paranormally Listed. You can submit the cases on our website at criminallylisted.com. For today's episode, we're going back to September 1983. On September 16th, 1983, a becoming action film star, Arnold Schwarzenegger, became a U.S. citizen. Schwarzenegger was born in July 1947 in Thal, a small town in Austria. He got into bodybuilding and dominated every competition he was in. In 1968, he moved to California. Schwarzenegger's lifelong goal was again to get into acting. His first role was in 1970's Hercules in New York. However, another actor's voice was dubbed over his own. In 1982, he got another starring role as Conan the Barbarian. This time, Schwarzenegger's real voice was used. Conan was a commercial success and it became a cult hit. A year after becoming an American citizen, Schwarzenegger got the role that launched him into international stardom, playing the titular role in The Terminator. He went on to become one of the biggest action movie stars of all time. He was also the governor of California from 2003 to 2011. On September 17, 1983, Vanessa Williams was crowned Miss America, becoming the first African-American woman to win the title. A couple of months before the end of her reign, nude photos of Williams, taken before she entered the pageant, were purchased by Penthouse Magazine and they were eventually published. After being pressured by organizers of Miss America, Williams resigned. However, she rebounded with a successful acting and singing career. In 2016, Miss America CEO publicly apologized to Williams. On September 21st, 1983, David Mamet's play, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, had its world premiere at the National Theatre in London, England. The play was a huge hit and it was made into a movie in 1992 starring Alec Baldwin, Al Pacino, Jack Lemmon, Kevin Spacey, Ed Harris, and Alan Arkin. The cold case we're talking about today happened in a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant. Kentucky Fried Chicken was famously started by Harlan Sanders. In 1930, when Sanders was 40, he was operating a gas station in Corbin, Kentucky. His family lived in the back of the service station. He would sell travelers some of his homemade fried chicken to generate extra income. The chicken quickly became popular and Sanders opened a restaurant. The problem was they couldn't cook the chicken fast enough, so he converted a pressure cooker into a flash fryer. This proved to be a revolutionary invention in the fast food industry. The restaurant's popularity took off. In 1935, a Kentucky senator gave Sanders the honorary title of Colonel. In 1952, Colonel Sanders had to close his original restaurant because new junctions and highways made his restaurant too far out of the way for the average traveler. But Sanders knew that his fryer and his recipe for chicken were a winning combination. So he started approaching failing diners and offering them a flash fryer and the recipe for his chicken for four cents for every piece of chicken they sold. This was a huge success for Sanders. In January 1964, at the age of 73, he sold the rights to the restaurants for $2 million and an annual salary of $40,000 a year, which was later increased to $75,000. He turned down tens of thousands of dollars in stocks. Colonel Harlan Sanders died in 1980 at the age of 90. This brings us to September 23, 1983, in Kilgore, Texas. There was a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant on the city's main drag. This was about seven years before they officially changed their name to KFC. It was a busy day at the restaurant, which was not unusual on a Friday. Like many places in Texas, high school football was a big part of life in Kilgore. There was a football game on most Friday nights in the late summer and fall. So Kentucky Fried Chicken was a popular choice for families on Fridays because they didn't have time to cook before the football game. It was so busy that day 
of the money, about $2,000, had yet to be deposited in the bank. We're just going to take a short break to bring you a message for our wonderful sponsor, Uncommon Goods. For the longest time, I've had the hardest time finding unique and thoughtful gifts for the special people in my life. I mean, does my dad really need another sweater? Does my mom really need another travel tea mug? But then I found Uncommon Goods, and I was blown away by their selection. I've almost done most of my Christmas shopping thanks to the website. One of the first things I found was a Make Your Own Real Viewer. It's one of those red real viewers for kids, but you get to add your own photos. Then, for one of my friends who's a whiskey lover, I got him a do-it-yourself whiskey kit so he can make his own batch whiskey. Then, for my brother who falls asleep while he's reading, I got him a McNeck bookmark that says, Fall asleep here. I seriously could talk for hours about the cool things I found on Uncommon Goods, but instead of me telling you about it, why don't you check it out yourself? Uncommon Goods products are often made in small batches, so you want to buy things quickly. When you do purchase something, you'll be supporting artists in small, independent businesses. Their products are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the USA. You won't find a better collection of meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere else. There is seriously something for everyone, and they break it down into categories like grandmother, brother, or girlfriend. One of the best parts about Uncommon Goods is that with every purchase, one dollar goes to a nonprofit partner of your choice. So far, they've donated over two million dollars. To get fifteen percent off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com/listed. That's uncommongoods.com/listed for fifteen percent off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Common Goods. We're all out of the ordinary. That night, as the restaurant was closing at around ten p.m., there were six people in the restaurant. 16-year-old Lynette Wilson, 37-year-old Mary Tyler, 39-year-old Opie Hughes, 20-year-old Joy Johnson, 20-year-old David Maxwell, and 20-year-old Monty Landers. At 10 p.m., Lynette finished her shift and left for the night. Mary Tyler was the assistant manager. She was married and had three children and two stepchildren. Everyone said she treated her stepchildren as if they were her own children. Mary had not been working that night. She came to the restaurant before closing to count the money and take it to the bank. Obie Hughes and Joey Johnson were working that night. Hughes had worked at the restaurant for about a year and a half. She was considered quiet and friendly. She was married and had three children. Joey Johnson had been a cook at the restaurant for about a month. He was the second of eight children. He was an excellent athlete who excelled at football, basketball, tennis, and track. David Maxwell was also a cook, and he had worked at the restaurant for about a week. But he wasn't working that night. Maxwell was married, and his wife recently found out she was pregnant. He was studying computer science. David was there that night to pick up his friend, Joey Johnson. Maxwell came to the restaurant with Monty Landers, who didn't work there. Maxwell, Landers, and Johnson were friends who attended Kilgore College. Johnson and Maxwell were in a fraternity, and Landers wanted to join. Landers was in college studying forestry. He was good with cars. He was looking for a part-time job as a mechanic to pay for school. He was the oldest of four children. All three young men were studying karate, but they were beginners. Mary's daughter, Kim Miller, stopped by the restaurant just before 10 p.m. She left before it closed and went directly home. Kim expected her mother to come home after dropping off the day's money at the bank. Around 10.30, Mary still wasn't home, so Kim drove back to the restaurant. Her mother's car and the other people's cars were still parked in the parking lot. She found most of the doors locked. The back door was wide open, which was unusual. She went inside and no one was in the restaurant. Two employee hats were on the floor. She saw some blood in the kitchen, so she concluded that someone had gotten hurt and her mother was at the hospital. So she went to the hospital, but her mother wasn't there. 
she ended up calling the police. An officer went to the restaurant and found some more blood. In the manager's office, there was a drawer where some money was kept. The money, about $500, was gone and blood was on the files in the drawer. The cash register was closed. The officer opened it and inside was the register's key. The money, about $1,500, was missing. It was a mystery as to what happened to the three employees and the two college students. It seemed unlikely that they would run off with the money, especially without taking one of their cars with them. Also, the blood seemed to indicate that something nefarious had happened. But until the five people were found, dead or alive, the police and their families would have no idea what had happened to them. But they wouldn't have to wait too long. We're just going to take one more short break from this episode. Let me tell you about the latest true crime podcast I've been binging, Morning Cup of Murder. You remember those desktop calendars that would tell you about what happened on that day in history? Well, Morning Cup of Murder took that idea and turned it into a daily podcast that now has over 850 episodes that dive into serial killers, cults, cold cases, murders, and more. Morning Cup of Murder is the best way to start your day because each episode is less than 10 minutes long, so it's perfect to listen to while having that first cup of coffee or tea in the morning. Morning Cup of Murder can be heard everywhere you listen to podcasts. Check out Morning Cup of Murder today. The next morning, a man checking oil wells about 12 miles from the restaurant called the police. He had found four dead bodies in an oil field. To get to the area, he had to drive along the main highway, turn onto an oil road, drive along it, and then turn onto two different dirt roads. The police came to the scene. They identified the bodies as 20-year-old Joey Johnson, 20-year-old David Maxwell, 20-year-old Monty Landers, and 37-year-old Mary Tyler. They were all lying next to each other on their stomachs with their hands on their heads. They were all dressed. The employees still had their Kentucky Fried Chicken uniforms on. The police searched the area. About 200 yards from the rest of the bodies was the body of 39 Opie Hughes. She was also dressed. It appeared that Hughes had tried to run away. Hughes had been shot once in the back of the head. David Maxwell and Monty Landers were both shot twice in the head. Joey Johnson was shot in the head, the neck, and the right side. Mary Tyler was shot in the head and the back. The police surmised that the killer, or killers, brought the five people to the field in a van or a truck. Then they made them lie on the ground. They were probably told that they wouldn't be hurt because no one was bound. But then, as they lay on the ground, they were executed. They thought that Opie Hughes got up and ran away. She was chased down and then executed herself. Autopsies were performed the day after the bodies were found. Several different types of bullets were used to murder the five people. Two different calibers of guns were used, a 38 and a 357. So the police believed that there were at least two killers. This would make sense because the five victims were driven out to the oil field. It would be difficult for one person to drive and keep all five people under control. Also, while the victims were shot with two different caliber guns, several different types of bullets were used. The police thought that three guns might have been used, which possibly meant three gunmen. When Joey Johnson's body was being examined, a piece of fingernail fell out from the waistband of his pants. None of the victims had ripped fingernails, so the police thought that the fingernail belonged to one of the killers. The police searched for miles around where the bodies were found for any clues, but they found nothing of interest. They also looked around the restaurant. One investigator noticed a box lid that had a unique blood splatter on it. Blood splatter analysis was an emerging science and the detective knew a bit about it. 
he thought that the blood was caused after someone was hit. In the office, there was a bloody napkin. Both the box lid and the bloody napkin were collected as evidence. What the police were hoping to find were fingerprints. The problem was that it was a popular restaurant and people had been in and out all day. There were dozens, if not hundreds of fingerprints in the restaurant that were unrelated to the case. So the fingerprints were a dead end. The crime shocked the people of Kilgore. At the time, the city only had a population of about 11,000 people. In many ways, it was a small town where everyone knew everyone else. So people were desperate for answers. Kentucky Fried Chicken put up a $25,000 reward for information. Other merchants in Kilgore matched the reward. Citizens also put money in the reward fund. But no useful tips came in. The police interviewed no criminals in the area. One of those people was 30-year-old James Earl Makins Jr. His father, James Makins, was a Texas state representative from 1975 to 1985. James Macon Jr. had several brushes with the law. In fact, he was released from jail for unlawful possession of a weapon on the day of the murders. That same day, he borrowed a weapon, a 38 caliber handgun. A 38 caliber was one of the weapons used in the murders. The police examined Macon's hands. On his left finger, the fingernail was torn down to the quick. Megan's denied committing the murders, and after being interrogated, the police released him. They let his fingernail grow in, and then they clipped it and kept the piece. At the time, it was thought the fingernails were distinctive, like fingerprints. It was believed that if you looked under a microscope, you'd be able to see unique patterns. So fingernail clippings were sent to a lab for comparison. The analyst said that the fingernail belonged to Makins. The gun Makins borrowed was also examined, but the ballistic expert could not determine if it was one of the murder weapons. The police had heard rumors about the Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant. Supposedly, hidden in the restaurant was a special recipe and it wasn't for fried chicken. It was for high-end methamphetamine. The police theorized that was the real reason that Makins went to the restaurant. The police thought that executing five people over $2,000 was excessive. But if it was over drugs, that might be a better explanation. However, the police didn't think that the fingernail was enough evidence to charge Makins with murder. But Makins was not the only person they were investigating. A woman named Star Powers was in the restaurant before closing. Two men were behind her in line. She saw one of the employees talk on the phone and heard her say that the deposit had not been done that day and there was about $2,000 in the restaurant. Powers was pretty sure that the men behind her also heard the employee talk about the money. So perhaps it was just an armed robbery that was a crime of opportunity. She described the two men to a Texas Ranger. The Ranger then sent the description to law enforcement in other jurisdictions. Someone from the Smith County Sheriff's Department said the description reminded him of a pair of cousins, Darnell Hartsfield and Romeo Pinkerton. At the time, Hartsfield was wanted for an armed robbery that happened in Tyler, Texas, three days after the Kentucky Fried Chicken murders. Tyler is about 25 miles west of Kilgore. Hartsfield and his accomplices were armed and they robbed the store just before closing time. Before they left the store, they made the employees lie on their stomachs with their heads in their hands, just like the victims of the Kentucky Fried Chicken murders. However, no one was murdered in the Tyler grocery store robbery. The Rangers wanted to talk to the cousins about the Kentucky Fried Chicken murders. 
but no one could find Hartsfield. However, they did find Romeo Pinkerton. He said he didn't commit the murders, and he said he had an airtight alibi. He was in jail when it happened. He was released a few days afterward. The five weeks after the mass murder, Darnell Hartsfield was arrested for the grocery store robbery. He was interrogated about the Kentucky Fried Chicken murders. He denied having anything to do with them. He was given a polygraph exam and he passed. So the cousins were eliminated as suspects. Without enough evidence to charge anyone, the case went cold. In September 1993, 10 years after the murders, the victims' families asked the authorities to reopen the case. They agreed and had DNA testing done on the fingernail. The lab concluded that it possibly belonged to James Makins Jr. Eleven and a half years after the murders, in March 1995, Makins was indicted for the murders. But before his trial, better and more sophisticated testing was done on the nail. In November 1995, they got the results of the test. The nail did not belong to Mankins. Also, in the years since the murders, it was proved that fingernails do not have unique and personalized patterns like fingerprints. So the charges against Mankins were dropped. The case went cold again. One of David Maxwell's friends, James Stroud, was inspired to get into law enforcement because of his murder. In 2000, he was a county sheriff. That year, Stroud met FBI agent George Keeney, who worked on the case in the 1980s. In December 2000, Stroud and Keeney looked at the evidence again. They got the blood samples from the box lid and the blood from the napkin tested. Blood from two different people was found on each. They were both former suspects. The blood on the box lid belonged to Darnell Hertzfield, and the blood on the napkin belonged to his cousin, Romeo Pinkerton. One problem was that Pinkerton said he was in prison at the time of the murders, and he was released days afterwards. But the investigator he told that to never followed up on what he said. The police believe that on the night of the murders, Joey Johnson was taking the trash out of the store after it had closed. The cousins, and possibly a third man, forced him back inside. There was a struggle, which caused Pinkerton and Hartsfield to get injured. After this, the cousins either decided or felt they had no choice but to eliminate the witnesses. The investigators continued to look at the evidence. They found semen on O.P. Hughes's pants. They then revised their theory about why Opie Hughes' body was found apart from the rest of the bodies. Initially, they thought she had ran away. Instead, she was pulled away, and then she was raped. Then, the investigators got a big shock. The semen did not belong to Hartsfield or Pinkerton. That confirmed to the police that there was a third accomplice. But no match to the DNA has been found and his identity is still a mystery. In November 2005, 22 years after the murders, Darnell Hartsfield and Romeo Pinkerton were charged with the Kentucky Fried Chicken murders. Darnell Hartsfield went to trial in August 2007. His trial lasted nearly two months. The jury deliberated for less than two hours. He was found guilty on all counts of murder. He was given five automatic life sentences. Pinkerton went to trial in October 2007. Three weeks into his trial, Pinkerton pleaded guilty to five counts of murder. He was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences. Six-year-old Romeo Pinkerton applied for parole in June 2018 and he was denied. He'll be able to apply again in 2024. 
He is serving his sentence in the James V. All Red Unit in Iowa Park, Texas. Darnell Hartsfield is not listed in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice database, so it's unclear where he is serving his sentence. The police are continuing to look for a third suspect, but he has not been found at the time of this recording. Thank you so much for listening to this week's podcast. Once again, if you have a case you want to suggest, please visit our website, criminalist.com. But that's all for today. Thanks again for listening. Please stay safe and take care of yourself.